that worked. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I know we're running a few minutes late, but there was quite a queue of people outside trying to get in, so I just want to make sure as many people can be here for the start as possible. But we also want to get through um, a really great session and don't overrun for the next one, so <clears throat> we're going to get cracking. Uh, just a, a quick one. Before. Um, the, there's a website you can log into, which is that, slido.com, and uh, the password is WTM London, or the hashtag, and uh, so we can today's and today for the next session as well. So, um, I should have stayed on this side of the stage if I knew I was going to be walking back and forth. Yeah, thanks Michael, you got my name right, well done. Um, my name is Homoza and um, I'm with South African Tourism and I'm just going to be sharing with you this afternoon just a few of the case studies of how we've worked with influencers previously. Um, yeah. That's it, really. Um, how we work with influencers beyond outreach. And I'm going to start with a campaign that we've got currently going on. Um, it's called Bucky Stories. And it is the name of a, it is an influencer-led campaign where we have three influencers that are traveling as friends to South Africa. We've got Maya Jama, who is an MTV um, cannonball presenter. We've got Alice Living, who is a blogger and author. And we've got Saunders Carmichael Brown, who goes by the name of Saunders Says, who is a vlogger. So three different types of influencers traveling together in a bikey. And we want, we, want that, we want our audience to ask, well, what is this bikey? So that we can say it is a passenger pickup truck. And the three friends are connecting and reconnecting as friends in South Africa on a road trip. While they are traveling to South Africa, they're going to, ex they're going to really get under the skin of the country. They're going to eat the different foods, drink a beautiful wine, and not drive afterwards because, you know, you can't do that. Um, we're going to get them taxis after they've done all the wine tasting. And then we're going to get them to meet South African locals and, and really um, just try and get as much out of the destination as, as, as possible. We chose the word bikey on purpose because we wanted to engage with our audience. We wanted to start a conversation with them. So now I've, I've given you a bit of a brief overview. So what? I mean, for us, this is our first ever influencer-led campaign. Um, our previous campaigns have always been with reputable outlets where we do a bit of content here and there, or we've hosted influencers who will do a blog post and you know do a tweet, and that's fine. But what we have done for the first time is we have engaged multiple channels to activate this campaign. We have engaged with our PR where we issued press releases and got coverage of the campaign of Bucky Stories of the three friends in South Africa. And as a consequence of this, we had Hello Magazine coming forward and saying, well, we want to do an Instagram takeover. Please send us all your footage so that we can show it to our readers. And then we had our very first, um, um, 
no, it's not our first, it's our renovated website where we hosted all the content and where we directed people to come through to our renovated website to see the content but also get inspiration of what else they can do while they're in South Africa. We also use social media because, because it's an influencer campaign, so it is primarily driven by social. We had a consumer competition where, again, we engaged a lot of the consumers and we said, you know, come watch our episodes and get inspired um, and maybe you can win your own road trip with your friends to South Africa. And so this has given us evergreen content. The three friends were in South Africa for 10 days and out of that we got 17 pieces of content that we're able to use on our YouTube channel. We're able to use for our training purposes. We're able to use in our marketing. A friend sent me a WhatsApp the other day saying oh I saw an episode on um, Channel 4 video on demand. And so we're able to use the the content that we've generated from influencers not just for influencer purposes but spread it right across all our other functions. And I'm going to share with you a video of one of the episodes. Hello, I'm Mai Java. Hi, I'm Alice Living. And I'm still this. And this is Backy Story. We're going from Nuremberg to Cape Town, the long way round. We're going to experience some amazing restaurants and try some incredible cocktails. Don't forget about the sharks and the bungee jumps. So, what are we doing now? I reckon we should go check out Yoda. Yeah, so do it. That's it. Um, that, that is one of our more popular episodes on our YouTube channel and I'm very excited because it's in Johannesburg. I'm not sure how many of you here know South Africa at all, but Johannesburg is just one of those places where genuinely you do not expect to buy a fresh pineapple in the middle of the street, in, you know, in the middle of Johannesburg, which is really exciting. But we've got 17 of these episodes, really, um, I mean, the longest one is about two minutes, but bite-sized chunk that we're able to feed them through social media and that are able to um, start a conversation with our audience. This is currently going on. If you're in the UK, follow our channels. There's a competition that's running until the 9th, so you can win your very own road trip to South Africa. Um, the next a project that I want to share with you, it's previous campaigns that we've done also with influencers. Um, this is a picture of a UK band, Mumford & Sons, for their performance in Durban in South Africa. I remember the day I got the call, a guy calls and says, do you know um, a bank called Mumford & Sons? And I remember thinking, no, no, I don't know a bank. I know a musical group. I know a band. And he went, no, 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 the band. I'm like, of course, yes, of course. So the story was, the four guys had been to South Africa, sold out shows in Johannesburg, in Cape Town, and in Durban. And they had such an amazing experience, they wanted to share it with their fans. And they approached us and said, would we like to partner with them? 
in bringing to life some of the experiences that they had in South Africa. And we went, sure, absolutely. So we put together a 10-day pop-up exhibition in Lights of Soho in London, where we had behind the scenes footage of the band in South Africa. We showed a documentary that they shot while they were in South Africa. We had performances. And this is the beauty of working with a big heavyweight like Manfred and Sons. Sure, you can use the influence, but you can, you can combine both online social media activities with offline. So we got to engage with their fans, with the music fans, and start having a conversation with them about South Africa, the destination, through their favorite band, Manfred and Sons. And I've got a video as well of the content that we were able to generate off the back of this partnership. Hi, Ben Lovett here from Manfred & Sons. Just wanted to share a couple of my favourite moments from our first trip to South Africa. We did a little tour, we went from Cape Town to Durban to Johannesburg, and each place had a completely different identity. And I think that's what was so amazing about just that brief couple of weeks we spent in the country, is that you can kind of really get everything from amazing seaside um, beaches, that unbelievably beautiful and kind of swim around with penguins all the way to a really exciting city that is, that is Johannesburg. It feels like it's right on the cusp of being one of the most progressive forward-thinking cities in the world and uh, we got to spend luckily almost a whole week in Johannesburg and meet a whole bunch of interesting people especially down in the the Bramfontein area and yeah it just kind of felt like as ever uh, as we are traveling the world as a band, just sponges taking all this information and really being inspired. And I, I couldn't recommend it more just to go and if you kind of want an urban like revitalization, definitely head to Johannesburg. But if you want to go and kick back and enjoy some sunshine and some good wine and have a, have a holiday, uh, Cape Town will, will look after you really well. I think there's an unfair brushstroke put across the whole of Johannesburg as kind of a you yeah. can't walk on the streets. Well, it's the first thing everyone, yeah, like, there's a lot of fear mongering around, isn't it? Yeah. It's the first thing everyone says to you, be careful. The younger people in Johannesburg right now are definitely really trying to, like, take a huge amount of pride in, in redefining that perception of this, this city. And that's pretty exhilarating. Those conversations are pretty amazing to be around, really. People want to do something about it. That was one of the most exciting projects we worked on last year. Um, and I mean, as you can see, the content is still so fresh. A year later, we're still able to use it. The last campaign that I'm going to share with you was a partnership with our friends at Panasonic Lumix. They were launching um, a travel camera, and they wanted to work with us um, because they saw synergies in the audiences that we speak to and the audiences that they also speak to. And we were able, through this partnership, to work with influencers in South Africa. Because when you think about it, the traveler these days um, does not have to rely on a brand promotion video from a tourist board. They can very easily find an influencer in the destination to follow because that is where they get a true depiction of what the destination is about. And so we played on that and we used that to our advantage where we engaged with two influencers that are based, one in Johannesburg and one in Cape Town, that's Kyle and JJ. And we gave them the cameras and we said, please take the best photographs of your city, um, the best photograph of Table Mountain, the most dramatic one, of wildlife, of some coastal activity, and of you know, Johannesburg, the city. And we promoted this through social media. We asked our followers to send us their previous travel photographs depicting the same. So send us your wildlife photograph following the zebra one, and send us your, 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 your scenery photograph following Kyle's one of Table Mountain. And what this allowed us to do was through influencer engagement, is these are people who, these are travelers who've been everywhere else, who've been to our competitor destinations, who've been to Costa Rica and everywhere else, but we are asking them 
to come and take their next best photographs in South Africa. And we are using influencers in South Africa to, do, to help us um, do this. And the, the, the other thing that we're doing with South African influencers is whenever we host influencers from the UK into the country, we connect the two. So JJ could very easily collaborate with an influencer from the UK and show you know, the influencer from here, you know, the best places where he goes for wildlife photography or whatever the case might be. This, again, was a very exciting partnership that we did. Um, in terms of some key lessons that we learned along the way, there really is no one size fits all in terms of how you work with influencers. And each one is different. And sometimes it really has to be led by the influencer because they're the ones that have built up their community. They're the ones that know their fans and their followers more than you do. And so you can't very well do a script and say, yes, here it is, follow it to the letter on brand. You have to almost let them do their thing and communicate the way they want to with their followers. What we've also learned, especially with working with non-travel brands, is it helps us have a conversation to inspire and to help, you know, to help travelers in their consideration stages. Um, with, the, with the camera one, for example, I was saying, I was saying earlier to uh, somebody that it's, we want you to say, I'm, I'm buying a camera to travel and I want to take this photograph in South Africa. And this is allowing us to have those conversations with people that are not necessarily in travel. But what we're also learning as a tourist board is establishing long-term partnerships with bloggers and influencers. And this is a thing that we're still trying to get right. But we don't want a situation where we, you know, we have a relationship with an influencer. They do one video, one tweet, one Facebook, shake hands, thank you, bye-bye, it was nice knowing you. We want to be able to build a mutually beneficial long-term partnership because then it shows from the, from the influencer point of view that they genuinely do believe in us as a destination and that their followers will see that. We're also trying very hard to work with the B2B partners to incorporate the trade because it's very well to inspire, but not everybody is in the same place in terms of where they're at with their holiday planning. Some people genuinely are looking to be inspired. Some people are looking for a little bit of extra planning. Some people are ready to buy, and we need to be able to facilitate that with our trade partners. And that is one of the things that we're learning as we go along. And so I hope I didn't bore you too much. That's my details. Please follow us on social media. Bucky Stories is still on, it's still up. Hashtag Bucky Stories, their social media um, um, handles. And yeah, I look forward to all your questions later. Thank you. a lot of people. Um, right, hello, my name is Joe Allen. Uh, now, unfortunately, as Michael mentioned, Emily's uh, not available, so I've kind of jumped in last minute here. Um, so if you don't mind, I do have some notes uh, just on my phone. Uh, this is put together very quickly, so it's just going to hopefully string through a collection of images um, over the past year. Um, so yeah, I'm Joe Allen. I'm predominantly a uh, YouTuber. I create a lot of content. Uh, around video in, um, to do with travel photography. So I go to destinations, create images, and hopefully inspire people to not only get out and take photos, but also to take photos in specific locations. Um, so I've spent the past couple of years traveling quite extensively, um, and it's, it's been growing really well. Um, so from the perspective of how to work with content creators, um, I'm just gonna talk on some of my experiences and I guess some best case scenarios that um, I feel have worked well uh, in the past for me. Uh, I will be open to questions and other stuff afterwards if anyone has specific details. Um, so content creators. Most have multiple social media platforms. Um, that's pretty much a given these days. Uh, it's not so much you have someone who's just a um, writer. You may have a writer who's also amazing at photography. Um, someone who's maybe on video, but they are uh, also a video editor. They are doing more than just presenting. Um, so when it comes to working with content creators, yes, you do need to kind of like think of 
uh, one particular platform, but you also need to think of the wider scope of stuff. Um, and of course, with a content creator um, comes audience. And the reason that you really want to work with a content creator is, of course, because of the stuff they're making, but also because their audience um, loves what they're doing. They're really engaged with it. So you, the main thing when it comes to working with creators is trust. So that's kind of the reason why you've reached out to them. Um, that's what you're after. You want the loyal uh, audience followers. Now, if you are working with content creators, if it's a good match with a brand, um, then generally everything flows pretty naturally. Um, in the past, when I've worked with things, if things maybe didn't quite match with the audience, then I'd politely decline them. Um, however, if stuff has come up that's been incredibly exciting for um, the content I want to create, then those partnerships have always worked out the best. So not only is it just about the social media aspect of things, um, so thinking wider than you know, just say creating videos, sending a few tweets, creating Instagram stories, some things from my perspective that can come about um, particularly to do with photography would be say if I was to go and produce some book sales or some photography prints, um, calendars, things like that. They may not directly relate to an audience immediately, but it has an overall greater impact because when it comes around to releasing those books, people may see those and they're like, I want to go to this destination. That's what's really inspiring me. So there's kind of uh, multiple directions to how working could, um, could benefit. So some examples of how I've integrated uh, travel and uh, photography together. So generally speaking, the content I make is geared towards photographers. Um, or filmmakers, people who are looking to go and make things. So they come to the channel because they're inspired by particular cameras. Um, there may be mentions of camera reviews or tech equipment. As they're watching it, so they could potentially be watching, um, I posted a lot recently about Fujifilm X100F. They may be watching about this particular camera. As they're seeing it, they're seeing Japan in the background. They're seeing the photos that I'm taking whilst I'm there and they are just falling in love with the idea of going to Japan. Not only that, but they are also then continually researching things. So they're obviously in a phase of potentially purchasing a camera, but at the same time, they may be in a phase of thinking, oh, you know what, I may purchase a holiday with this camera. Um, so ways that, um, that I've personally worked um, have been around, say, product focus, destination second, um, but other influencers may work in completely different ways. It's all about finding out what they can offer beyond what you may think is just visible. So how can a brand support a content creator? What is available? Um, now, as you mentioned before, it's not a case of just saying, here's an itinerary, you go and do all this, because sometimes that doesn't always fit. Obviously, the creators know their audience. They know what they're looking for. So working with them from the very start to create an itinerary is probably the best way you can actually work with people. Um, so for experience, some things that have worked really well um, could be, say, uh, providing accommodation uh, along with transportation. Now, it's not necessarily a, an ad placement, but it could be a case of um, working with a car hire company that is taking you around and that is featured throughout. It's not a forced integration. It's just a case of, oh, you know what? We've obviously seen um, in the day-to-day -day videos that you've hired this car with this company and it's flowed through to there. Um, so essentially offering support of free things like works quite well. An example of something that's worked really well with me was with Fujifilm Australia. Now they had no obligation for anything for me to post. They just wanted to get the cameras in my hands. They had so much trust in their cameras that they knew that I would love them. As it turns out, I did love them. Um, I was using them all a lot. That's quite convenient. That's actually Melbourne. Um, and I was taking photos all the time. I produced loads and loads of videos about Fujifilm simply because I had the camera in my hands. There was no payment between us. 
There was no obligation of, yes, you must do this once a week, whatever, whatever. Um, it worked perfectly. From there, I then, myself, I sold it to myself. I then went and bought a Fujifilm. Um, I fell in love with it so much, and they were just super cool about it. Like, everything just flowed naturally because it was a perfect fit. But then we have to bear in mind, there are also sometimes when a brand has a particular aim or they have a, a direction of a campaign, um, in which case that would be um, essentially a, um, an advertisement. And if you're going to put ads, then you really do need to be paying. It's kind of, sometimes it can be a little bit disheartening when you hear of communications between brands and content creators and there's no payment involved, um, but at the same time it's saying, we need you to publish this, uh, at this specific time with this particular hashtag and can you mention this campaign because we're trying to sell more flights for whatever. It's like, hold on a minute. You're utilizing this audience that we've spent a long time building and that we trust and now you're trying to emphasize profit on your company but there's no monetary exchange between the creators. So it, it can become a bit gray area on things um, but I th think it's worth pointing out that there are times um, when payment is kind of necessary to get the best results on stuff. So after um, you may have set up a particular campaign, if you have a particular goal, you really need to find out ways of how you can track those goals. It's all very well saying, we want to encourage bookings. How are you going to know if people have booked them? So offering particular incentives to the viewers, to the, the following. Um, maybe it could be specific links that you've, you know, you've probably seen these on um, Instagram and YouTube descriptions. Book through this link, you'll get a discount. The audience is happy because they've got 15, 20% off a hotel stay or something like that. Um, the brand are happy because they're encouraging bookings. And the content creator is happy because they're able to offer something of value. It's not a case of they're the only one getting something free out of the exchange or they're not, um, they're not taking in all of the glory from the audience. Um, following all of the work and the campaign, it is paramount to follow up. It's really quite sad to hear um, from both a brand's perspective and a content creator's perspective when after something has happened, silence. Like you just, you finish the campaign, you've not heard anything. It's always just nice to just carry on and communicate, you know, how did the campaign go? Did it achieve what you liked, my audience seemed to like it, here's some great comments that I've had from that, just to really round it up. Because at the end of the day, everyone at companies and everyone who's a content creator, we're all just people, we're just trying to make the best stuff. So if there's something that maybe hasn't gone particularly to plan, maybe you can find out how to fix it for the next time. Maybe it wasn't a perfect match. Um, but yeah, just the idea of leaving someone in the dark after you finish something is kind of a bit disheartening. Um, so yeah, make sure you do that. And I always encourage feedback. I think it's nice when you've finished something to just say, was there anything that I could have done better? Was there anything that I should have done or that I completely missed from the mark? Likewise, communication throughout the whole brief, um, but afterwards uh, is definitely important. Um, so yeah, I can talk for ages about um, working with particular brands and I've got you know, plenty of time for this afternoon. Uh, I hope that was all good in some way. I hope Michael was happy that was, uh, yeah, jumping at the last minute, but thanks. <laughs>
So, so it's not it's not one of the ones on the board. How do you handle campaigns with different kinds of creators on them? So, how do you manage multiple different types of content creators on one campaign? Ah, uh, well, I mean, I ended up saying, for the most part, it is letting the influencers take the lead, and so it's especially nice when you have different skill set in one group because then, depending on what the skill set are, you know, the one influencer might be very strong on, you know long form written content, whereas the other one may be very strong in photography, the other one may be very strong in, in video. And it's really just making sure that the three integrate and work well together. And we really encourage collaborations amongst influencers because, um, and sometimes, you know, when you learn from each other, you're able to get the best out of each of, each of them. But it really is letting each influencer, I guess, um, you just shine in their own strength and in their own skill. Okay, cool. I don't think there's much for you to add on that side, Joe, because I'm guessing you're not selecting people <laughs> to go in your campaigns. Um, so, Joe, I guess this one's more for you then. Um, so, which social media network works best for you uh, for sharing content uh, with influencers, but sharing in general as well? Yeah, um, so primarily my, my biggest audience is YouTube. Um, but it wasn't my first audience. So I was, uh, I'd been writing a blog about seven years before I started YouTube. Um, pretty sure no one read it. Um, I was just happily posting photos, just writing whatever, um, you know, sharing it with former colleagues and all sorts. But as soon as I started YouTube, um, that was when the audience just started to roll in. And I think a key thing um, with this, and I, I hear this the same with uh, bloggers talking about Pinterest, is that when content's on YouTube, it's there as a library. It's just a catalog, it's, it's there to be searched. It's less in the moment as something like Instagram, um, definitely Twitter and Facebook. So, and of course YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So, definitely for me YouTube. Um, following that Instagram, uh, I personally love it. Um, I feature my work on there all the time. Um, since the stories functionalities have come about, that works really well and at times get more engagement through stories, which of course are so short-lived, you know, they're 24 hours, um, than I would if I'd have posted something, um, I don't know, for maybe a couple of weeks or so. Um, so yeah, YouTube and Instagram, I'd say, are top for me. Okay. Um, anything else to add? <laughs> I'm not even going to try anymore. Um, <laughs> okay, great. So, um, for the Backy Stories yeah. uh, campaign that you did, uh, what were the criteria, um, or were the, the criteria that you used for selecting the influencers? Um, we want we want Backy Stories to to come across as three friends, and so the biggest criteria was three people who would who who, who would get along, because the last thing we wanted was to put three people in a Backy across South Africa for ten days and they be personality clashes. But as well, it wasn't just the number and, or follower count. We wanted different, Maya Jama was, came out quite obviously as the leader of the three, um, be, you know, because of you know, her, her work on MTV. But as well, Alice was a different kind of influence in the sense that she's more about clean eating and being healthy. So she was gonna explore more of the food and wine and drink element of South Africa. Um, and Saunders was the almost adrenaline junkie out of the three. Who, he was the only one, incidentally, who in Durban jumped off the biggest, the tallest swing in the world. And the girls went, oh, well, we'll let you have this. And so, and so it's, it's, it's nice to have different kinds of personalities and different kinds of, I suppose, niche areas that they that each of them brought, um, and it made the three, the chemistry between the three really work. So it wasn't just purely numbers and follow account, but it was the fact that each of them brought something different into the backy, really. Perfect. Yeah, I think the, the importance of finding people who get along together for a trip like that comes so far above anything else. We, uh, we ran a campaign with Traverse with uh, 50 influencers last year, which was a week away, and that was our number one criteria, okay, picking people who we know are going to get along, because if you have one argument, it can spill over to lots more. Um, secondly to that comes how effective they are as, as well. So, thank you. Um, from that campaign, what would your, uh, 
how are you measuring like the the return on investment, the KPIs? Uh, well, what were your KPIs specifically? Um, there, there were a number. Um, were the, the reason for the uh, the other reason for the influencers was because they appealed to what we call our wanderlust audience, and this is the audience that we have discovered through our own research that they're likely to travel to South Africa sooner and they're likely to overcome some of, you know, some of the barriers. They're the ones that will be looking out for deals. They're the ones that will take recommendations from these influencers you know, to make decisions on their next holiday. And so the objective was to get a lot more engagement out of our younger Wanderlust audience. Um, and some of our key performance areas were, of course, increased engagement on our social channels. But as well, we had a renovated website and we wanted to get as many people as possible visiting that. And so that was one of the call to action a lot on visit our website for more information, for example. So that was one key, um, key performance area that we were keeping a very close eye on. But as well, again, we don't make an assumption that everybody is in the same headspace in terms of their planning a holiday. Um, some people are looking for inspiration, some people are looking for a little bit more planning, and some people are looking to book. And through our trade partners, we wanted to see exactly the kind of traction that our campaign got in terms of how many bookings did it generate, etc. And we had deals to that effect on our website for that. Okay, great. So, and um, Joe, just as a follow-up to that question, do you, from the influencer side, is there a, a usual um, way that you would approach working with a brand to show what your value is, um, I guess to show what they should be measuring. Uh, yeah, I think from the very start, communication is, is great. Like if, they, if they're approaching you for a particular thing, you want to find out what that thing is. Um, so to find out, you know, as bluntly as asking, what are you looking to achieve from this? Um, you know, what do you hope to gain? And from there, you know, asking them um, kind of from a variety of perspectives, from your perspective, from the business, um, from the audience perspective. That way you can really sort of tailor the, um, the narrative and direction. So if I have, you know, a, a commission that we want people to come to a particular event next year when it happens, then you would make a video that is um, throughout the whole thing informing the narrative of how frequent an event happens, why you should come to it, how you would um, in benefit from going there. Um, as an example, like that, essentially, is, it's just asking, like, what do you want? Perfect. Thank you. Um, what would you say that digital influencers offer that traditional journalists can't? Um, I, <laughs> I guess you could list it for a long time from both sides of that, but have you got maybe a top three or four? Uh, for me, the, the big thing with um, content creators is most of us, we are individuals or you know, we work in a partnership or something. That is a very, very quick time to publish. Like if we have something that's ready, we've, you know, we've still put in the same research that a journalist would do. We've still experienced the same things and you know, um, say travel to city, but when we want to publish, we can publish when we want. Uh, and with that, we get so much more real-time engagement with the audience. Um, journalists may potentially have to go through um, publishers, much longer process, things could become out of date. Um, you could have delayed response on, you know, I'm just thinking of, say, you were, um, doing like a, a magazine and a newspaper or something like that. Um, that's like a big thing, timeliness. The other aspect is I generally find the audience have followed my content for a very long time. So they know so much about my previous history. If there's something that they enjoy and I personally didn't, and then I go to something else and I don't enjoy that, they know that they know their meter on what their enjoyment matches up with mine. Uh, likewise, if it's the other way around. Um, so you can really gauge the opinion based on their opinion of things. Um, I think that's like a, a big factor. I don't know if that made sense at all. But. Yeah. Um, so, just to also add, in, 
in, in my experience, it has always been that influencers are a lot more relatable, I guess, to, to, to consumers because if it's Joe, then I know it's Joe who is, has a camera, a Fujifilm, and you know, there's, you know, there's, no, there's, no, there's no smoke and mirrors. And, um, and you've built a community because people genuinely want to know from you what your experience is. And I think this is the big difference between influencers and traditional media. The fact that the influencers are, you know, it's a lot more personal, the relationship that the consumers have with the influencers. I think there's <clears throat> lots of places you can find online um, information about studies or surveys or, um, or research people have done which uh, shows the way that people view kind of blogs and bloggers and YouTubers um, and it, it, it kind of sways much closer towards the recommendations that they take off friends and families than it does off newspapers and magazines um, and personally I think that's something that you just you can't replicate that with an article in the Daily Mail um, at all and obviously you know we've seen it we've, we've posted up um, case studies before from, from other influencer campaigns that show the amount of bookings that are driven from strong influence campaigns over traditional media and even when you're talking about some of the biggest websites in the world, people simply don't book from them um, and then you do see that from, from influencers because they're following someone that they trust and someone that they like and it's a lot more similar to how it would be if one of your friends told you um, over a coffee of a trip they liked or a, a product they wanted to buy. So Joe, uh, this one's for you. So as a full-time YouTuber and influencer, um, sorry, are you a full-time YouTuber? So I'm going to answer that. Yes, Joe is. Um, and beyond launching a YouTube channel, uh, what was the turning point for your success? Uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I do work full-time. Um, I, I think I kind of pushed myself full-time maybe a little bit earlier than... I was financially able to. Um, for me, the passion is and will always be to make content. Um, I love taking photos, I love making videos. Um, a turning point to making it more comfortable, um, it's difficult. I think, um, I think working with Fujifilm actually was a big turning point for me because it, it opened me personally up to a new experience of using Fujifilm, fell in love with it so much and it came through so naturally in the videos, um, but at the same time it attracted a whole new audience of people interested in Fujifilm. Um, matching that up with doing the same thing but in Japan, which again captured my heart um, a couple of years ago and just the passion comes through so much about Japan. I think that was like a, a huge turning point to maintaining a um, like a, an avid collection of followers um, yeah it's hard to, there's no real one moment it's a continually evolving um, idea okay great um, so we we've got time for a, a couple more questions what we do like to uh, make sure we do at the end is to leave uh, enough time that if anybody wants to come and ask us anything personally, maybe they didn't want to ask there or didn't get a question asked, um, the three of us do come up and, and ask us. Uh, so we try and leave about five or six minutes between the two sessions that we have. So, um, come on, so uh, this, yeah, uh, this one's uh, for one view. It's um, if the guy's doing Slido, if we can just drop off the first two, the top two that are there, oh, sorry, um, because we're just going to ask or, all three actually, because this is one question. So um, basically, how do you do your research to find the influencers? I think that's pretty much all three of those in one, though. So if we can get another yeah. question up for afterwards, that'd be great. Um, places like World Travel Market are actually a good source of information for influencers. There is a speed marketing session happening tomorrow. But as well, being at places such as this um, means that we are able to invite, you know, to have almost like an open door policy to say, we are here at South African Tourism and we'd like to engage. We'd like to find out a little bit more about you and you know, what you do and how potentially we can work together. But, and, and this is what we do. The, the beauty of uh, places like World Travel Market and even Traverse Events to some extent is that the influencers that you work with have already gone through the rigmarole of being vetted. So I don't have to do any of the hard work 
I know that the people are legit, they, they're for real, and you know, they've done previous work in the past, and they don't necessarily even have to be that big, but they have to have you know, a solid reputation, a small community, um, and be leaders, I suppose, in their cho chosen niche. This is generally. Cool, thank you. Um, I would say to that question, uh, we, we never talk about Traverse when we're doing these seminars, which uh, obviously is a massive missed opportunity, but there are groups out there, like Traverse is one of them, and there are lots of other options as well, where if you are struggling to find the right influencers, we're going to make sure the ones that you've got are right for their campaign or your campaign or what you're looking to do. There are people out there who can help do it or help set up campaigns. Um, I know us at Traverse that we're usually more than happy to give a couple of pointers and it's not something that we try and charge anything for most of the time uh, for quick stuff. So basically, do if, if you've got question marks over influencers that you might want to work with or if you want some pointers in the right direction, just ask someone who knows, someone who's done it. You, know, you will know someone else in marketing. You'll know a blogger or a YouTuber that you really like and you can say, what's your opinion on this person? Do you think they'd be a good fit? And I generally find that this community and this industry, both travel and influence as a whole, uh, some of the most willing that I've ever worked with to, to help each other out. So never be worried about asking people. If they tell you they don't want to help you, then they're not ones you work with again. Um, Joe, I want to... <clears throat> I want to finish on the question about are you having any horror stories because it's been popped up about five times. So do you have any specific nightmares that you've had? Um, you don't have to name the brand like they've asked for, but uh, if you've got... Not, not so much horror stories. Um, I've definitely seen other people struggle with uh, managing how to, I guess, save face. Um, yeah, generally speaking, um, I've, I've had pretty good relationships with all the people I've worked with. The, the issues that have come up multiple times generally actually are around um, expectations between uh, a particular brand and the creator. Um, and usually that comes up when there's free for free, no payment um, involved. Uh, so there have been times when you, know, you are um, given a particular trip, you may be sent somewhere, but they've not got you there. So you have to make your own way there. You're putting in your own monetary uh, expense to, to get you there. And then at the end of it, they're asking um, for all of your photos so that they can then go and do it in their advertising. And you sort of think, I, you know, I work in photography. If you wanted to hire a photographer, you would pay a photographer because you you want photos. So just because I'm creating stuff for an audience as well, which also adds value, um, doesn't mean that it should be for free. That's probably the, the biggest sticking point I've had, um, particularly with photos and with licensing. Um, because if you then saw your, like if I saw my photo on a billboard advertising flights for you know, a, a huge price or huge markup, um, and they just took that, then that's a big deal. Um, of course, if you want to get a photo for something, then I'll happily license it, but just communicate about it. That's probably the cool. big thing. I think it's also important that people realize if you're sending a great photographer who's an influencer, you can always discuss this up front in advance. And I know that quite a lot of the campaigns we're working on currently and have worked on in the past with, um, with brands and destinations from around the world, it's been something that they've said, if you've got someone who's strong with that, and we negotiate a second contract with them before they go away, and you can get both. And it, it does still make it a lot of the cases cheaper than hiring two people separately um, yeah and you can get some great results from it so we do want to pretty much wrap up uh, we have another session coming up about the importance of diversification um, when you're an influencer and also as a brand strategy when working with influencers so uh, I want to say a really big thank you to uh, Komatsu and to Joe uh, for helping uh, well for making this a great session and uh, for, to South Africa Tourism for sponsoring this one so thanks very much guys